I want you to imagine something. Now, this is something you might have heard already because a homeschool kid told me, and uh, I know these stories get around. But I want you to imagine that in your heart are two dogs that are fighting each other. And they're fighting pretty badly. They're fighting pretty mean. They actually want to kill each other. There's a big black dog, a big mean black dog, and a big white dog, a beautiful big white dog. And if this black dog wins the fight for your heart, well, what do you think is going to happen? Who could make a guess when you let the evil dog win? Yeah, what do you think will happen? Oh, you die. You do die. Yeah, but a lot of stuff happens first. <laughs> a lot of stuff comes out of your mouth first. A lot of words, a lot of your hands do all sorts of stuff first. How about over here? What, what do you think might happen if you let the, the big evil black dog win in your heart? What do you reckon? You turn evil. Exactly. The, dog, the evil dog wins and you turn evil. But there's a white dog in there fighting too. Now what happens if this white dog wins? These are dogs. These aren't humans. They're not people. These are, these are black and white dogs. What do you think happens if you let this white dog win? Yeah, little one. <laughs> just like to put his hand up that's all right well you don't die and you don't do evil in fact you do good and then you live forever now these dogs are in your heart they're fighting and these dogs represent some of the things we want to do right you know how sometimes in life we want to do good things we want to be nice to our parents we want to say nice things but sometimes we want to do the bad things we want to kick and scream and steal How do we make sure the white dog wins? We feed it. We feed the white dog, and then it wins. And what we feed it is the truth. We feed it the word of God, and we feed it prayer. And then that white dog wins out the battle. Now, this metaphor falls apart. I know we've got some theologically minded people in the crowd, but remember these are, this is just a very quick parable, one major point. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for these children. We thank you that as covenant kids, Lord, you have promised to work within them. You have promised to be their God. Lord, we pray that in time, if you haven't already, that you would bring them all to a saving faith, that you would implant within them good and holy desires. Lord, we pray that they would make use of the Bible, of the word, of prayer, of good Christian friends. And Lord, we pray that you would uh, bring their salvation to completion. Lord God, we uh, ask for these things in Jesus' name because he's the only one who can do it. Amen. Okay. <clears throat> Our sermon that text this morning is in the book of 1 John, chapter 2, verses 15 to 17. In your pew Bibles, that is in page 959. First John was written by the Apostle John as an old man. He's uh, writing to a church, uh, or a group of churches, they say, uh, based around Ephesus and that part of Turkey. They've just been rocked by a split. Uh, a <clears throat> bunch of people in the congregation decided that they um, had a special vision from God and that that meant they had to leave the church and go live lives of debauchery um, and sin, and that uh, God was on their side. 
John was an old man writing to the church, um, uh, assuring them, comforting them, that even though they've been rocked by this disturbing thing to happen, a split, that uh, those who remain and abide in Christ, uh, those who fix their love upon God, will remain forever. Uh, So we're in page... 9.59. Uh, I'd like to actually start at verse 12, just for a bit of context. Uh, Let's read. I am writing to you, little children, because your sins are forgiven for his name's sake. I'm writing to you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. I am writing to you, young men, because you have overcome the evil one. I write to you, children, because you know the Father. I write to you, fathers, because you know who, uh, him who is from the beginning. I write to you, young men, because you are strong. The word of God abides in you, and you have overcome the evil one. Our sermon text for this morning. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. And the world is passing away along with its desires, but whoever does the will of God abides forever. Let's pray one last time. Hopefully not the last time we pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that it is like food to our souls. We thank you that through it you speak to us, you show us who we are, and you show us who you are. Lord, we um, know that were it not for a work of your great Holy Spirit, the Bible would be just another book. It would be true. It would be, uh, it would be internally consistent. Uh, it would even be beautiful, but it wouldn't be saving. It wouldn't mean a thing to our souls. So, Lord God, we pray for your spirit. We pray for your spirit to work through me that I may speak from your word. Lord, we pray also that your spirit would dwell among those listening that uh, we would be listening with open hearts uh, and with uh, hungry mouths. Lord, we uh, pray that you would speak to us this morning, that I would diminish and that you would increase and that we would uh, rest in and be amazed by the love which you have poured upon us in Christ. In his name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, good morning again, Covenant. I've entitled this sermon, Love is Not Love. Now, we're Christians. Our entire identity is wrapped up in love. We're not a social club or a fan club. We aren't even... We aren't even the, the great truths, not essentially, we aren't even the great truths that we share. We are in our most essential being those who have been loved by God, who have been redeemed and washed clean and filled with new loves and new affections, ones who love God. God has fixed his love upon us and transformed us in that love, in the power of knowing for certain that we have been forgiven of all of our great sins. And in Christ, by the power of the Spirit, with this new love, pumping in our hearts and flowing through our veins, we are now people whose lives are overtaken 
and consumed by love. We love God when we didn't before. We love one another. We're learning how to do it better, but we love one another. We love our wives the way Christ loved the church, not the way everyone else loves their wives. We love our wives with love. We even love our enemies. Jesus said, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. For what good is it? Even a even the Gentiles love their friends. Even the non-believers lo love their friends. But we love and pray for the good of people who even hate us. Love is the greatest of all virtues. God is love. But love is not God. Love is not a self-defining uh, self-justifying standard of goodness. Christians are called to follow Christ in showing radical love to one another and to the world around us, even our enemies. But our passage before us this morning tells us that love is defined by God. There is a love which we as Christians are supposed to hate. We're to despise it and turn away from it. It's a love which is independent of the God who is love and which left unchecked will kill us. But it is a love which in Christ we have been redeemed from and in the power of the Spirit we are able to put it to death. Now let's take one more look at our text. Our text this morning, starting at verse 15, is a command followed by two arguments. The command is this. Do not love the things of the world. Uh, do not love the world or the things of the world. We can comfortably say, that of our text, this is the point. And that command is followed by two reasons why we ought not to love the world. The first is this. You can't love the world and love God at the same time. Love of God and love of the world are mutually exclusive. That means if you have one, you have to give up the other one to get it. It's like a cake, you know, you can't have your cake and eat it too. Mm. Or it would be more experiential to say that one weakens the other. When you pursue the love of God, it weakens the love of the world. When you pursue the love of the world, well, it weakens the love of God that you have in your heart. We remember the words of Jesus on the Sermon on the Mount. You can't serve two masters. You'll either love one and hate the other or obey one and despise the other. Now, my, my wife and I are watching a show on Netflix. It's, um, it's a game show based off of Squid Game, which came out during COVID. And this is called Squid Game, The Challenge. It's basically Squid Game, but they got a bunch of Americans in, and they're, they're replicating it. It starts with about 500 people, and they're all competing in children's games and psychological puzzles. The great prize is uh, 500, uh, five and a half million USD, which is a horrendous amount of money for a game show. It's a life-changing amount of money. And you watch this show week by week, or as we do, uh, all in a row. Um, you, you see that everyone's gunning after this money. And depending on the situation in front of them, they form these quick alliances. But whoa, what happens when they have to choose between their alliance and the great prize? It is, uh, it is a window into the soul of humanity this show it's called squid game the challenge 
probably safer to, safer to watch than Squid Game, but it is a fantastic show. But it shows the truth that when it comes to our ultimate desire, the heart is e exclusive. It only follows one thing. Because in verse 16, it says that all that is in this world, the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and the pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. There's a fundamental opposite, that when you love the world and God calls on you to forsake the world, you're going to have to forsake your alliances to this world in order to chase after the great prize. But what is the world? John describes the world here, this world, which we're not to love, with three components. He says the things of the world are, firstly, the desires of the flesh, by which we're talking about that sinful preoccupation we have with bodily pleasure. Right? Last week, Paul tells the young men, Paul tells Titus to, to ensure that the young men in the church of Crete are what? That they're self-controlled. That they are in control over the desires of their flesh. Because our bodies are created to experience the greatest of pleasures. What's the chief end of man? The chief end of man is to glorify God and, and to enjoy him forever, right? We're a good Presbyterian church. We know that, our, that, that the body of man and women is designed to be the recipient and the experience, to, to experience the greatest of joy, the presence of the glory of God. But in sin that drive, that capacity, that, that, that home that, that we're supposed to feel in the presence of God is hijacked and the desires of the flesh start filling it with pleasures from down here, from down below. The obvious example is sexual joy, a good thing, a very good thing, God's greatest gift but only to be experienced within the covenant of marriage. God's given us food, a great gift to nourish us, to eat with each other. But again, too much, too often, not enough exercise in between, and we become slaves to these things. Wine, a gift from God to gladden the heart. Again, too much, too often, and we're lost. Everything in its place. The second thing that defines the world is the desires of the eyes. These are things which look good, right? And they're things which when we have, they make us look good. They make us look better. Better than, well, better than those who don't have them. The first is things that make us feel good. Second thing, those that make us look good. Again, you know we're supposed to look good? Isn't the language of the Bible to be anointed, to wear our white robes, to enter into, enter into God's presence, to be redeemed and made beautiful as a bride washed and adorned? Humans are made for beauty just as we're made for pleasure. But we're made for beauty in God. Remember the fundamental difference between the religion of the Pharisees and the religion of Christ? What's the fundamental point of the Pharisaical religion? He says, woe to you, Christ does, because you clean the outside of your body and your behavior but inside you remain full of greed, full of self-indulgence, 
Outwardly, you appear righteous, long prayers, um, best place in the synagogues. But within, hypocrisy and lawlessness. In short, what we have is an overindulgence in the things which pleasure us and make us better and more beautiful, and by implication, better people than others. The last thing is this concept called the pride of life, which is a tricky term to translate. It sort of means one's station, one's possessions, one's status, one's property. Uh, The word literally means life. The word is bios, which is where we get the word biology. So we can see there's already this element of sort of poetry in there. Not, not pride of your, of your bios, yourself. <clears throat> Think of the widow who Jesus commends, right? They're at the temple and they're seeing everyone give their offerings into the plate. There are the Pharisees, again, the people who have this pride of bios, this pride of their selves, this, this, uh, this, this ego, and they're putting in gold and silver. And Jesus says, uh, that this woman is the one who he commends because the Pharisees have given but a tiny part of their surplus, but the widow has given out of her, out of herself, out of, out of, out of everything she has and everything she is. So it's this pride of self that encompasses everything and, and becomes the great guiding principle by which we uh, use and enjoy uh, the pleasures and the things of this world which are good and beautiful. We take all these things together, and what we have is the man-made religion of the worship of self. Chief end of man, glorify himself. Make others glorify you. Make others enjoy you. Put yourself in the place of God and be the king of whatever small patch of creation God has placed in you. Now, the love of God is different to the love of the world, which is selfish, self-justifying, self-promoting, self-congratulating, which is the worst of all. The love of God... It goes out to the Father, and then it is satisfied there. It goes out to the Father, finds great satisfaction in Him, and then it curves round, and it manifests itself in a great love for one another, so that you can share this love that you've found, the satisfaction you've found with the Father, with others. It's a fundamentally different kind of love to the love of the world. The love of the world goes to uh, the world and then it recurves back on yourself and then it pushes other people down so that you can be greater. They're two fundamentally competing types of love and one pushes out the other because the other is the opposite. The second reason why John says not to love the world or the things in this world is because, in verse 17, the world is passing away along with its desires, but whoever does the will of God abides forever. Now, there's an end coming to this world, Holy Scriptures say. There's an end coming to this world and for everyone who's in it. John describes there'll be two categories of people at the end. There will be those who are saved, those who do the will of God, and there will be those who are not saved from the judgment. It will be those who loved the world. Those who were in the world and who were of it, those who drank it deep and took on board its culture of self-promotion. 
you remember the final chapters of John's Revelation? Right? The great lake of fire. Who goes in? I was trying to find it while I was studying. I read a commentary and the chapter was called Everyone Get in the Pool. First, who goes in the pool? The beast, then the false prophet. These are uh, <clears throat> abstractions. First, these are the enemies of God. These are things which, which God hates. These are the, the persecutors of the church. These are those who use religion as a justification for self, for self-worship. All into the pool. Next, who goes into the pool? The devil, the tempter. Then death. Then every single man, woman, and child who loved the world. John describes them as cowardly, the, father, uh, the faithless, and the detestable. See, that second reason why we shouldn't love the world is because those who love the world are destined for this lake of fire. It's coming, and it's not a natural event like an earthquake, right? It's not this indiscriminate shaking where there's destruction and it seems like there's no rhyme or reason to any of it. It will be a calculated destruction. It will be a measured and righteous destruction. And it will fall upon any who love the world. It will fall on any and not just on them, but on them and to the degree to which they loved the world and drank deep of its poison. Now, if only you could just tell someone, right? Hey, stop loving the world. Don't love the world. Love Jesus instead, right? If, on if only you could, right? Imagine, imagine the evangelism with just, you could leave a tape running. And you could just tell people, right? Hey, turn away. <laughs> you know, don't love the world or the things in the world. But that's not how the heart works. It's just not how the heart works, is it? And if it was, we'd be, we'd, we'd be in even more trouble because somebody stands up and they say, my testimony is I was walking down the street. Somebody held a Bible, told me to stop loving the world and love Christ. I said, I will. And then I did. Well, now you're going to be guarding them from every Jehovah's Witness and Muslim and every Hindu who's going to come along and say, hey, stop loving Jesus, love Muhammad instead. Stop loving God, love, love anything else, love my company instead. The Holy Scriptures in Proverbs 21 says this, the heart of man, that's, that's the, the part of us that loves the part of us that, that drives us towards our loves. The heart of man is a river in the hands of the Lord. He turns it and directs it wherever he may please. Our love is like a river. It flows out of us and it takes its course and it, and it flows into what, that which we love, whatever it is that we love. We love the world, it flows into the world. We can't control its direction or its flow. We can't tell our hearts not to love the world. We can't tell anyone else's hearts not to love the world. We wish we could. How great would it be if you could reach into somebody's soul and just flick that switch that turns the desires of someone's heart away from the world and towards the Father. But we can't. Only God has that power. Again, Proverbs 21. The heart of man is a river in the hands of the Lord. He is the one who turns it and directs it wherever he pleases. If anyone here doesn't yet believe, hasn't put their trust in Christ, if anyone here doesn't love God, loves the world to God, is just here for... <laughs> God only knows why you're here. Think about the implications of Proverbs 21. 
You don't believe because you can't believe. You don't have the power to believe or to love God. You can't make that change. Only God can. So if that's you, and you don't want that to be you, all you have to do is ask. All you have to do is ask God to take his hand in your heart, to redirect it away from sin, and direct it towards himself. And away from the futility, away from the love of money, pride of life, and away from the great lake of fire. And he will, in Jesus' name. He'll sever every connection you have to this world and its perishing pleasures. And John knows this. John knows this when he tells us. He tells us, do not love the world. John knows that, that the, the heart of man is a river in the hands of God. He, he knows this. But flip back to John's gospel for a moment, to John 3, if you will. Keep a finger in 1 John but just flip back. I'll pull it up in my electronic standard version to John in chapter 3, the great uh, God so loved the world, verse in verse 16. Scroll down even more to John chapter 3 and verse 19. And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world. There's that word again. There's that, that world, that, that complex, which we've been talking about. And people, the people of that world, remember the world is, is an abstraction. It's, it's, a, it's, it's what it is. It's a group of people, a culture. The people love the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light. They hate God. They love the world and does not come into the light, lest his works should be exposed. But whoever does what is true comes into the light so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out by God. If you love the light and hate the darkness, if you love God, and you hate the world, even in small, if there's this, this small seed, if you feel that there's this something, if you sin and it doesn't, doesn't quite sit well with you, that is evidence of the work of the Holy Spirit in your heart. It's small. It may be small. It's been small in my life. But it's evidence that the Holy Spirit has been at work in your heart. It's the beginning of something great and good and eternal. So what is John doing? He knows all this. He knows, he knows that uh, you can only come to the Father, that everyone hates the, the light. Unless they're born again, they won't leave the darkness and come to the light. So what is he doing? Well, first of all, John isn't writing the command so that we can earn eternal life. Go back to our passage at verse 12. I am writing to you, little children, because your sins are forgiven for his name's sake. Because your sins are forgiven. I'm writing to you, fathers, verse 13. This is of 1 John chapter 2, verse 13. I am writing to you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. You, you, he's not a stranger to you. Your sins are forgiven if your faith is in Christ. You have been born again. And if, you've, if you have this, this, this heart in your chest, which is pumping the love of God, even in small measure, then you can know that you can turn your heart. No, you can't. And you can know that God has turned your heart away from the world and fixed it eternally upon him. The command to turn from sin is given to us as children who have already been saved. We've already been chosen. We've already been loved. 
We've already been redeemed. We aren't going to pass from death into life by loving God or serving God or doing anything in Scripture which tells us things which God likes. In John's understanding, the call to love God and the call to sever those ties with the perishing word is grounded in the secure knowledge that you're already loved and already forgiven in Christ. This is John writing to the church, remember. That God has already redirected the flow of your heart away from the world and towards himself. And that, that work which happened in Christ by the power of the Spirit is the bedrock of your assurance. Christians, the call to, to, to not love the world and to love God is a call to faithful Christians to stand in Christ and recognize your true position before God. All of those things which, the, which, which come from the world, all those things which entangle us, right? The, the pleasures of the flesh, whatever they may be. The pleasures of the eyes. The things which make us feel like we, we ought to be, that, that we are better than other people. All of those things that, that entangle us have been defeated in Christ because they just don't sit right with us anymore when God has implanted within us that love of God. They always, they always come with that aftertaste, don't they? They come with that bad aftertaste that we just hate it. We sin, of course we sin, but we sin unwillingly. We sin as mortal enemies with sin. Martin Luther, when faced with temptation, he used to yell, well, he used to do a lot of things. Don't, don't, don't do everything that Martin Luther did when faced with temptation. He used, he used to throw an ink pot against the wall because he was a demon there, so he threw the pot. <clears throat> he farted as well. This is all church history. Uh, you, he used to fart to, to banish demons. Take, take church history, if you can, with GTC. Martin Luther, fan, fantastic reformer. Um, quirky, quirky man. But one thing he used to say when faced with temptation is he would say this, I have been baptized. He would say, I am in Christ. And these temptations don't have power over me because my heart has been claimed by another. Now, I forgot where I heard this illustration. Uh, so, I don't know, some strategic Googling will find it, I'm sure. But the Christian life, the Christian heart, the Christian walk is like this big mansion, but it's run down. It's derelict. There's termites in the, in the, in the ceiling beams, and there's black mold in the shower and rats in the kitchen. That's our life. Every room, right? Pride, lust. Anger, you know, flip, flip the wrong switch on a day when we haven't had our breakfast yet and, and you'll discover an even, an even greater, you'd say, oh, wow, look, there's a greenhouse back here and all the windows are smashed out. Um, you'll find even more parts of yourself which are full of love of the world, far from the love of God. But because of the love of God, the accomplished work of Christ on the cross, you can rest in this house knowing that it's been paid for and that you have a Bunnings card with infinite credit and you have the Holy Spirit himself to help you make these renovations. That you can just wake up, and this doesn't matter if you've been Christian for 10 minutes, and you're sort of feeling your worldview rearrange under your feet, as it were, 
or if you've been a Christian your whole life and God bless you, that sin you didn't put to death in your 20s followed with you into your 30s. The sin you didn't put to death in your 30s is followed with you into your 40s. And now you're here and you're old and you're still ashamed. You still haven't done it. You have got a card with infinite credit, infinite resources to make these changes today, to start today, to uh, move forward without shame, without the fear of condemnation or dread, and to put those sins to death, to clean up those rooms, to clean up those attics, to put in a spa, to put in a, an orrery, or whatever it is that you might want to put into your house. All those things which God is going to give to you. The new self, new affections, love for God, love of charity, love of your neighbor, a, a heart for missions, a heart for the lost. Because the love of God fills the space and pushes out all of those other loves, all of those loves which entangle you and tie you to this world. Now, a few points of application before we close. If you don't love God, don't look for that love anywhere other than God. And this might also go for, for, for Christians too. If you don't love God enough, if you have sensed that there is a coldness in your heart, do not look to improve and then grow in that love. Don't look anywhere other than God. You won't be able to produce it on your own and no one else can produce it for you. And nothing down here can give it to you either. If love of God and love of the world push each other out, you can't expect to push out the love of the world with anything other than the love of God. So I want you to remember this as you, as you think through what you might do, as you think through how you might read scripture, as you think through how you might join a prayer group, that without fostering the love of God, which comes from God, your prayers and your Bible reading plans will be utterly worthless to you. Nevertheless, seek to know the God that you love. Seek to know him. You know, there's this great distinction we make, or our previous generation makes it, uh, um, that you know a lot about God, but you don't know God. You know that distinction? You who know God, seek to know more about God as well. Knowing God is important. Knowing about God is, is just as important. Because how can you know him who you don't know about? Read scripture to learn more about this God and about what he has done for you. Second, I'm going to speed up now. Admire and appreciate the work of the Spirit that, 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 that uh, uh, admire and appreciate the work of the Spirit in the lives of others. Maybe you, you don't have much love of God for yourself right now. You're in a season where you just don't have it. Look around and see who has it. Ask them why. Ask them to tell you what God has done in their lives. Seek to learn more from, from others, from people around you, as to the wonderful things that God's doing. More. Cherish that love of God when you discover it inside of you. Sometimes, even in our cold lives, in our cold seasons, we just have this flicker, this glimmer, where, you, where ah, you remember something in Scripture or you hear a sermon and, and this, this feeling. I know we don't like feelings, but God made them. 
we have this feeling which, oh yes, this love of God, he did this. I remember the first time I heard this particular verse, I was so filled with, filled with joy about it. Cherish that. Guard it like a little flame and protect it. Feed it with scripture and pray that you can enter into this journey, into this emotional love, into this love and appreciation of what God has done for you. Fifth, enjoy songs, hymns, and poetry because they speak to us in ways that words can't. Songs and hymns and poetry, we have been created with this, with this line that goes directly to our heart and it's stimulated by music. God put it there. God made it for us. God inspired poetry and music in the book, in the, in the Holy Bible, in Psalms because it speaks to us in great images, complex images that words can't. Lastly, <clears throat> big broad strokes. Our lives can be so full of so many petty warring desires that we just can't be sure which sin we should work on first. And so what ends up happening is we don't work on any of them. <laughs> You know, do I attack my love of money first or my fear of this first or do I attack this addiction first? But I tell you this, that the love of God is a general cure. Our, our, it's a general cure and it compounds. Sometimes, going back to our analogy where our life is like this mansion, sometimes... You just need to open up every door and every window and just let God flood the house. Just big, broad strokes. And then see what, what gets dislodged and flushed out. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you so much. We thank you that you have made us and we thank you that you have redeemed us. That all of these warring desires, all of these capacities we have to love are met in you. And Lord, while this may not be the case now, we know that we have the Holy Spirit as a down payment and that even now we experience in small part the great integrated life of joy that we have with you in heaven, we experience in part now. We know that when you return, when Christ comes, we will be made holy and we will be made full and that we will experience joy and pleasures at your side forevermore. So Lord God, we pray that you'll be with us through this week that you would fill our hearts with a love for you and that you'd push out all those other loves. In Jesus' name, amen.